Hey guys, what is going on? It is your good buddy Sam, and uh, it's time for another exciting Max MSP tutorial. So, today I'm going to talk about how to do some uh, more cool visual effects, this time inspired by the Gantz Graph uh, video. Um, where is it? Or I don't know if it's the Gantz Graph video, but a Gantz Graph video anyway, um, for that song Gantz Graph by, I think it's Otecker. But in any case, it's this video, it's got this really cool kind of cube and geometry and stuff distorting in the middle of this uh, crazy, abstract, glitchy landscape, and it's really, really interesting and um, really dense visually. And um, it turns out, I mean, the, the, what's really impressive about it actually is the sync between audio and video, and I happen to know that the video was not made using jitter or even any kind of real-time processing whatsoever. Whoever did it actually achieved the close sync of audio and video just by doing this thing that I, I personally, I've never, never done it myself, but this thing called working really hard. Um, somehow using working really hard, they were able to make this really amazing video. Um, we're not going to work hard, we're just going to use jitter. Um, to do not that video, obviously, but, you know, achieve a similar kind of effect using isosurf and some distance functions and some other cool stuff like that. So, let's get started with some boilerplate OpenGL stuff. Uh, you know the drill by now, QMetro33, oh my god, my voice, what's going on? Um, trigger, bang, bang, erase, what, I'm not able to talk. Can you imagine that be? Um, trigger, QMetro, erase, jit.gl.render. Attach the bang and the erase, and send pre-render. Cool. And then down here, we'll make a key, a cell 27. Then we'll make a, a toggle and a full screen dollar sign one. And then a jit dot window. Excellent. Connect these up like so. And why, why? Very, very cool. Cool. There's our boilerplate stuff. There's our video. Turn on rendering and window sure turn gray. Window turns gray. Excellent. We are in the driver's seat and we have started the car. Okay. Um, now that we've done that, let's talk a little bit, of a, little bit about what we're going to do. We're going to uh, want to throw down a cube in the middle of this world that we've created. And we're going to create that cube using jit.gl.isosurf. Um, the way this is going to work is essentially we're going to compute a density field. So what jit.gl.isosurf does is it takes as input a three-dimensional matrix. Um, so in this case, it's going to be a matrix that is 32 by 32 by 32. And for each point in that matrix, we need to pass, for each cell in that matrix, I should say, we need to pass a density value. Um, and then what isosurf does is it looks for places where um, the density function goes from small, low density, or air, to high density, like solid object, and then uses that to basically uh, wrap a mesh around the really dense parts of our density field. So you can imagine it by, um, you can imagine it, uh, it's similar to, I don't know, if you had an object in the real world, and you um, were asked, some, someone would just like, pick points in space that contain that object and then ask you how dense the object was at that point. That's basically what we're going to pass to this isosurf object. Um, so, only we're actually going to do the opposite. We're going to take uh, a given point and for each point we're going to calculate not the density but rather how far that point is from the object. So points inside the object are going to have distance zero and points outside the object are going to have some number that is how far that point is from the object. And then all we're going to do is pass the, take the negative of that, we're going to invert that and um, use that to calculate our distance geometry. It's pretty cool. So start by making this um, jit.gl.isosurf object. We've got to pass a whole bunch of parameters here. Dim 32, 32, 32, just sort of the granularity of this isosurf object. Uh, scale, 2 point, 2 point, 2 point. It's going to make it a little bit more easy to visualize. Um, the iso level should be about 1.1. This is loosely speaking um, how sharp the transition, how dense something has to get before uh, isosurf considers it to be solid. 
And finally, at epsilon, and this is the magic number here. Um, actually, getting a good value for epsilon here is totally something you have to play around with to, uh, in your specific application. Here, a value of minus 0 0.025 happens to work well. Uh, in this particular application, where we compute a distance function ra rather than a density, you have to use a negative epsilon value. Otherwise, your object will look stupid. Um, so bring this down here and then add a uh, receive pre-render and then make a JIT, uh, JIT dot matrix one float 32, 32, 32, 32. And then all we're gonna do is take this matrix, bang a new one out on every frame, do something to it and pass it to isosurf. And what are we gonna do to it? We are going to use JIT.gen, everyone's favorite Everyone's favorite object, jit.gen. Oh, you will need max six and gen to do this tutorial. Sorry about that. Um, so connect these up like so. Uh, open up jit.gen, bring this window to the front, and let's uh, let's get to it. So delete this plus and this in two. And what we're going to do now is, uh, for this input matrix, we're not interested in what's actually in the cell. We're just interested in which cell it is. So get rid of this in one and type in snorm. And snorm is not a Dr. Seuss character, but the signed norm of the cell. So instead of saying, let's look at cell 16, 16, 27, signed norm um, expresses that cell coordinate in with a number in the range of minus one to one. So the point at minus one, minus one, minus one is the point closest to us in the bottom left. And the point one, one, one is the point furthest from us in the top right. So given that snorm, First thing we're going to do is multiply by five. This will give us a little more room to work with our uh, object. Next thing we're going to do is subtract that, uh, or take the absolute value of that, rather. So to compute the distance of a, a coordinate point to the cube, um, a point, say, uh, well, all we have to do is subtract one, right? I mean, the cube is one by one by one, so a point's uh, distance to that cube edge is just gonna be that point minus one. Um, and of course, if a point's at, say, minus five, then we would take minus five, and we would um, subtract one, and then take the absolute value of that. So first thing, we, so uh, we're interested in, sorry, distance, not the um, uh, absolute, uh, vector distance, like which direction you'd have to go from the edge to get to the point. We just want the distance, so hence we take the absolute value. Next we subtract 1, this is the size of our cube. Then we take the max 0, because points inside the cube are have distance 0, they don't have negative distance. And finally we take the length, which is just the length of that vector. Uh, this operation is for x, for y, and for z. We're taking that vector output and computing its length. As you connect this up like so, bam, we got ourselves a cube with sweet rounded edges. I'm going to attach a jit.gl.material so we can get uh, some shininess on our cube. There we go, very shiny. And so we can rotate it and look at it. I'm going to make a jit.gl.handle and uh, put a reset message up here. So if we'd like to reset our handle, we can. And hook that up to the isosurf. And now we can check out our cube which looks pretty sweet, am I right? That's our sweet cube. Okay, so you may at this point be asking yourself, quite justifiably, you may be asking yourself, or you may be yelling at your screen right now, I don't know, um, why go through all this trouble to make a cube when there is a grid-shaped cube that can do it uh, way faster and that doesn't have these goofy, rounded edges? Well, the reason that you do it this way is because A, now we have a ton of control over each individual point on this cube, and B, we're actually guaranteed a kind of uniform distribution of vertices across the surface of our cube, and that means that we can do these really nice undulating kind of distortions to our cube and still have everything look good. So to do that, um, I'm, so let's put our money where our mouth is a little bit and actually make some of those cool uh, distortions happen. What I'm going to do is jump back into Gen here. I had three parameters. Param uh, phase, zero point. Param freak, that's freak with a Q, not an EAK. And give this an argument like five. And then param, uh, this last one, amp. And give this the argument zero point three. Okay, so now what we're going to do is uh, compute a sinusoid and add that to this distance. So we're going to say, okay, take the cube and um, distort it. 
add a number to its um, add a number to it that depends on the z coordinate. Um, so where you are on the z axis. So we're going to Swiss z to get only the z coordinate here coming out of snorm. We're going to multiply that by freak. We're going to add um, phase, but we're going to add phase multiplied by 6.283, which is very roughly 2 pi. People probably know the digits of 2 pi further out than I do. That's for damn show. And then we're going to uh, take the sign of that and finally multiply this. No, finally multiply this by amp. Cool. Look at that, very exciting. Okay, so there is our uh, sinusoid component being added to the distance function. If we look at it now, the cube looks, well, actually pretty normal. That's because we need to play with these parameters to make it really get exciting. So let's do param freak dollar sign one and param, well, we can just copy this, huh? So there's a frequency, and we can make this modify the amplitude, and this will modify the phase. And I'm going to move this over a bit so we can see how each of these actually affects um, the object here. Connect these up like so. Connect this up like this. And now let's move this window over here so we can see what's going on. So you see, as I adjust the frequency, we get more and more ripples in this object. As we adjust the amplitude, we make the ribbles, ribbles, the ribbles. They do kind of look like ribbles, actually. We can make the ribbles bigger, bigger and smaller. Um, and the phase just determines like uh, where these waves are starting. So as we up, up the phase, this thing basically ripples. And it looks really, really cool. Um, so what we can do now is we can uh, automate this stuff. Throw in a phaser, um, frequency argument here, and then, um, what am I doing? Oh, snapshot. Sorry, my brain absolutely and completely disconnected for a second. It's, I'd like to say it doesn't happen to me very often, but it actually happens basically all the time. Hook this snapshot up like this, crank this phaser up a little bit. Uh, you're not working because phasers... Oh, pff, audio's not on. Easy DAC. Start the audio pumping. Now we've got our sweet cube. And I think... I played around this before. I think frequency is at like 5. A bigger amplitude. Yeah, look really cool. So there you go. Here's um, playing around with IsoSurf. And as you can see, you can make uh, some really interesting stuff happen here. You can imagine what would happen if you started to connect these parameters up to sound or MIDI or whatever. I mean, the uh, world is your oyster. Go nuts. You know, a um, lot of fun stuff to play around with there. So in any case, uh, that concludes this really quick tutorial. And it will probably be just the first of many looks into doing this kind of processing. Um, but I hope it was enjoyable as always. I hope it was informative as always. And as always... Um, if you're uh, if you're local and you want to grab a beer and talk max, you know you know where to find me. Um, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you guys very soon. Bis bald, as they say.